So hello, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, I'm Eliza. I'm the registered dietitian that works with Restaurant Associates. We do the food service on the HMS campus here, uh, the cafes and also catering as well. So um, we do these virtual teaching kitchens. We do a virtual one every month, and we now do an in-person one every month, too. Uh, the in-person one is on campus here. It's in the uh, Joseph B. Martin Conference Center. And... They're super fun. They're during the lunch hour. So if any of you happen to come by, you can. But the virtual classes are always free. So, and they're at dinner time, obviously. So that's a great perk to that as well. Uh, I also have somebody here helping me today. Uh, Kathleen's gonna, she's in the kitchen with me today <laughs> instead of at a desk. So hi everyone. I'm Kathleen, I'm Eliza's um, dietetic intern. So I'll be watching, I'll be watching the chat if anyone has any questions. And yeah, I'm excited to be here. Yeah, thanks for being here. <laughs> We're making a Middle Eastern inspired meze platter. Meze means appetizer. So that's what we're making tonight. Um, and we're doing lots of really delicious, delicious uh, flavors and foods here. I'm going to touch on each of them as we go, give some fun, uh, you know, cultural background information and also some nutrition tips. So some safety things up front. We don't have any like ingredients that are dangerous to be handled raw. We're not, we don't have any raw meat or anything like that. That is my favorite thing about vegetarian and vegan cooking, that you have less stress about food safety. That's a really good thing. Um, but always make sure that after you've cut all these ingredients, any leftovers you have, make sure you put them in the fridge before uh, the, the food safety rule is that you don't want things to be left at room temp for more than four hours if you intend to cool them down again. So make sure you put everything in the fridge later. Uh, let's see. Um, if you're gonna be cooking along with us, I hope you have a nice sharp knife because sharp knives are safer than dull knives because they get a good grip. Uh, if you have a dull knife, it can slip and end up cutting your hand. A nice sharp knife, especially for the tomatoes we're gonna be cutting tonight, sharp knives are key. They're very, very helpful. And also make sure for any of the hot things that we're handling, make sure you've got like an oven mitt and just be careful around the heat. And that said, I'm gonna jump into what we call our plan of work. This is the order in which we are following, you know, pre um, prepping all of these ingredients, so that everything ends up ready at the same time. So the first thing we're going to do is cook our bulgur wheat. So the bulgur wheat is going to be for the tabbouleh salad. So we're going to cook our bulgur wheat first, and that's going to take about 10, 15 minutes, maybe, maybe even less. So we're gonna set that to the side and then we're gonna cut a whole bunch of ingredients. We're gonna get all of the cutting and chopping stuff done at the top of the class. And then we're gonna get into the fun mixing stuff after that. Uh, then we're gonna make our tabbouleh after our, hum our um, bulgur has cooked. Then we will talk about some different kinds of legumes and we're gonna make some hummus and potentially some other bean-based dips or legume-based dips if you wanna try something other than chickpeas in the hummus. And then we assemble our plate. So we have lots of fun toppings to put on this meze platter as well. I would recommend if you're eating this for dinner tonight, try and find a nice big plate or a good sized platter so you can put everything on there together and just pick at it and uh, put your dinner together. All right, so we're gonna jump right into it. And like I said, the first thing we're gonna do is cook our bulgur wheat. So I've got behind me my induction burner. I'm just gonna bring it over. And I forgot to mention this, but you should be able to see there's an overhead view here. I'm going to add this spotlight. So you're looking at what I'm doing here. So you can look down at my cutting board. Um, and Kathleen will be switching back and forth between these views, whatever makes the most sense. So I've got a small pot here, just a small sauce pot. And I'm going to put the bulgur, that's two thirds of a cup of bulgur wheat. And bulgur wheat is really cool. I'll talk about it once we get this boiling. Two thirds of a cup of bulgur wheat and one cup of water. And I'm gonna put this on high to bring it to a boil. So bulgur wheat is an, what's called an ancient grain. It's something that's been around for thousands of years. It's been used in the Middle East and other areas of the, wor of the world for thousands of years. 
this grain is, uh, it's wheat and it's processed in a certain way that makes it really awesome for quick weeknight cooking. It can cook in, you know, max 15 minutes, probably even less. And uh, the way it's processed is it's, you know, the grains are picked from the field. They are um, like parboiled. So they're cooked a tiny bit, not fully cooked, but just enough so they can, you know, be easier to cook later on. So they're parboiled, then they're dried, and then they're cracked. So instead of it being a whole, uh, you know, an entire grain kernel, it's kind of broken into pieces. However, the outer layers of the grain are still intact. So that's what you want from an actual whole grain. That's what makes whole grains uh, more beneficial to your health because those outer layers of the grain have tons of fiber and protein and healthy fats and all kinds of micronutrients that you're not gonna find in processed grains such as white rice. So bulgur wheat cooks, you know, like I said, in under 15 minutes compared to some other whole grains like farro, which I love, takes, you know, 45 minutes, maybe longer. Wheat berries is another one that takes, you know, an hour maybe to cook. So bulgur wheat is definitely an easier option. So because there's not a whole lot of water in here, this is coming to a boil already. You can see the bubbles a little bit. So you have two options here. When you get to this point, you can either turn it down to low, the lowest setting you can, and put a lid on it and walk away, or you could even just turn it off and put a lid on it and walk away. It'll be done in 10 to 15 minutes. So I'm gonna turn it down to low, and I'm gonna put this behind me to get it out of my way so I have my cutting board back. So I've got it on low. Commercial kitchens don't like lids on their pots for some reason, so I'm putting a big bowl on top. Does the same thing. The point is you're trapping the steam in there. So we've got the bulgur wheat back behind me and we're just gonna check back in on it after we're done cutting up all of our ingredients. So that's literally it. You could add salt and pepper to it, but because we're mixing it into tabbouleh, that's gonna have plenty of flavor in there as well. So. Very easy at this point. I'm grabbing a big mixing bowl. So everything we're about to cut is either gonna be going into our tabbouleh, gonna be used for our hummus, or will be used as raw ingredients on the platter at the end. So we're gonna start with the ingredients that go in the tabbouleh. And after we cut them, I'm gonna put them straight into the bowl just to help keep your kitchen a little bit cleaner. So everybody ready to cut? Let me know if you want me to slow down, and I'm happy to. But I'm gonna move along if I don't hear anything. So we've got a couple different kinds of herbs that we're using today. One of them is parsley. This is curly parsley. Uh, this is what we happened to get delivered from our food vendor. Uh, flat leaf parsley is actually more um, like an authentic ingredient used in this. But um, it's the same flavor, same, you know, texture, same everything. It's just like the leaf's a little bit curly. So what we're going to do here, this is already washed, by the way. All, all of your produce should be washed. Um, what I'm doing here is I'm lining it up so, like, most of the leaves end in the same spot. And I'm just going to cut off those stems. And you can discard these, you can compost them, or you can save them for a vegetable stock if you like. And so now what we've got are some stems, but mostly leaves. That's what's important. So we're gonna be chopping this, but before I do that, I'm gonna pull my mint leaves off as well and we'll chop it all together. So this is fresh mint. It smells so good. I encourage you to uh, try some while we're going through this. That's also another beautiful thing about vegetarian cooking is that you can eat as you go and you don't have to worry about cooking things to temperature. So all I'm doing right now is I'm pulling these leaves off the stem here. The stems of mint are like more tough than 
um, parsley, they're thicker and they're a bit more tough. So you could put this into something that would break, you know, if they were gonna be cooked, it would break them down. But uh, this mint is gonna be raw in this dish, so we're not gonna be using the stems. So I'm just pulling off these leaves and you can smell if you're cooking along. Mint is super aromatic. The smell is so good. And mint and parsley are two very common herbs used in Middle Eastern cuisine. A lot of the ingredients we're using today are very traditional to Middle Eastern cuisine. Um, that also includes lemons, chickpeas, and lentils. We'll be talking about some different legume options when we get to that part of the class. Um, garlic, for sure. And of course, olive oil. That's definitely not just uh, not just heavily used in the Middle East. That's heavily used all over the place. All right, so I've got my mint leaves in a pile here. I'm just gonna kind of roll them up and like bunch them together a little bit. And I'm gonna roughly chop them and then toss them in with my parsley. So what I'm doing with my knife is I'm holding the base of the knife. I'll show under the other camera. I'm holding with my thumb and my pointer finger, holding the base of the knife, and then I'm wrapping my other fingers around the handle. And that kind of makes your knife be more of like an extension of your arm. So it's much more ergonomic. So that's how we're doing it. And I'm putting my point of my knife down and rocking it down. That gives you the most like force behind every swipe of your knife. I've had classes, in-person classes, where people were just cutting like up and down like this, but it doesn't really give you a whole lot of uh, like force behind your swiping. So, all right, I've pushed all my herbs into one pile and what we're doing for this tabbouleh is we're mincing everything. We want to mince, mincing means just chopping super, super fine. So you don't really have to be so careful with where you place your blade as long as you're being safe. You really just want to chop all over this whole pile of herbs here and cut everything nice and small. Uh, when we were testing this recipe, the I didn't cut the onion small enough, I didn't cut the tomato small enough, and when your ingredients aren't cut small enough, that means that they're not uh, like, you know, uniform in this dish. You end up with bigger chunks of things that you didn't necessarily want. So when you cut everything super small, you're able to mix everything really well. So that's definitely what we're going for here. So you just keep on chopping, keep pushing it into a pile over and over. It's also like a nice satisfying French sound when you chop into this big pile of herbs. And I was talking about the, uh, you know, we have the parsley stems here and that gives a bit of extra crunch and texture to this tabbouleh. You could, if you had endless patience, you could go through and pull all of the leaves off of your parsley, but no one has time for that. <laughs> There's no need for that. Also, something I really like about this dish, we used an entire bunch of parsley for this. We only used four sprigs of mint, but we used an entire bunch of parsley. So none of that parsley is going to waste. I always hear people saying they don't buy fresh herbs because it goes to waste. They never use the whole bunch. But this uh, recipe, you use all of the parsley. So you can see I've got some nice small pieces here. So I'm gonna go ahead and toss this straight into my bowl. So my big mixing bowl that I have off to the side, I'm putting that straight in there so I can get it out of the way here. You know, wipe all this parsley off my cutting board now. And the next thing we're gonna do is our tomato. We're doing our um, plum tomato. Um, I might have, I'm trying to remember, I had a few different versions of this recipe. 
uh, the version of the recipe you have may have said just cherry tomato. So if that's the case, um, you can use your cherry tomato in tabbouleh. You can use the cherry tomato as like a you know dipper at the end, whatever you'd like to do. But um, you know you can use a larger tomato as well for the uh, the tabbouleh. So the first thing I want to do is cut this in half. So I stood it on the stem end and I cut it in half. Then you always lay it down on the wide flat side so it's safer for you to cut. Cut it in half again. Then I'm removing my stem here. Be very careful with your fingers. Cut the stem off of all these pieces. And again, because this is going into the tabbouleh, we're gonna be mincing this, cutting it super small, which is kind of hard to do with tomato, especially if you don't have a sharp knife. So I'm laying this on a nice flat side and I'm cutting it into thin planks. I'm only doing like a quarter inch or, or thinner if I can. I'm gonna do that for all of my uh, pieces here, all my quarters. Cut them into thin planks. Scoot that out of the way. Tomatoes also are, uh, this is not a very known, well-known fact about them, but tomatoes are an excellent source of vitamin C, which is becoming more and more important as the weather gets colder. So I'm cutting my final quarter of tomatoes into slices. And then what I'm gonna do is lay it down, kind of fan them out like that. Then I'm gonna cut them into strips like this. Make sure you get a nice good grip. And then you turn it 45 degrees and you dice it. So we did planks, strips, dice. So I'm doing that with all the planks here. And I'm just putting those into a pile. And once I have a bunch of diced tomato, I'm gonna just go through one more time to mince everything. How's everybody doing at home? Those of you cooking along. Any issues so far? All good. All right. Hopefully your knives are sharp. This is the ultimate test, cutting a tomato. Let's see how sharp your knife really is. <laughs> if you've ever used uh, a honing steel at home, that's like the best knife sharpening uh, home technique, it's really not that difficult. It looks kind of like fancy when you see chefs do it. When our chef uses one of those, he goes so fast. It's like you can't even see his hands move. So definitely the average person does not have those types of knife skills. But if you can get a uh, honing steel, that really is a great way to sharpen your knives at home. I uh, just recently got one, to be honest, and I just sharpened all my knives and I could not believe it, how easy it was, uh, how like, I thought like, I'm for sure doing this wrong, you know? And then when I cut some tomatoes for the first time, I was like, whoa. So I definitely recommend it. All right, so we've got some nice small tomato pieces and I'm gonna toss those straight into my tabbouleh bowl as well. So right now we've got tomatoes, parsley and mint in there. All right, so the next item going into our tabbouleh, actually, why don't we do the other tomatoes while we're talking about tomatoes here? I have a fun trick to show you. So we've got some, these are grape tomatoes because they're oblong. Cherry tomatoes are spherical. That's the difference between the two. I have a really fun trick here. I have two like deli container lids 
And this is a really helpful trick for cutting tomatoes in half. So I have the lip side. This is the lip side facing up. I'm gonna put some cherry tomatoes in a single layer. I don't wanna overstuff it, okay? And then I have the other one with the lip side again, but facing down. So I'm holding these tomatoes in place. They're trapped inside here. And what I'm gonna do very carefully is push down on the top. I'm pulling my fingers back so they're not getting in the way. I'm pulling my fingers back, pushing down on the top and I'm going right through with my knife. And now these are perfectly cut in half. It's a super, super easy trick. I highly recommend. If you don't have deli lids, you can do it with two small plates, um, but just be super careful. You want to make sure that whatever lip you have on the edge is holding them in place. And I, truthfully, last night when I did the test run for this class, I was using a different knife and it wasn't sharp enough. So I was struggling. So I had to get one of these different knives that we use for our in-person teaching kitchen class that is super, super sharp. And you saw how quickly and effortlessly I just did that. Oops. I think my phone is frozen. <laughs> well, it's frozen. Well, I'll show you this way. Super, super fast and easy. Hopefully that unfreezes itself soon. Um, okay, so I'm, there we go. I'm putting my cherry tomatoes just off to the side because we're using those as a topping later. Okay, now we're moving on to the onion. I had a pretty big onion, so I'm only using a quarter of it. If you are a real onion lover, then you can use a half an onion as much as you'd like. Uh, or you can do like a nice little small onion, do the whole thing. But I don't want to overdo it with the onion. So we've got here, this is the root end. It's got like the stringy, kind of like dirty end. And this end is where, so when an onion grows, the roots are down here and the greens come out of the top. So the root end is where all of the layers of the onion connect. They all connect up at the top there. So you don't want to cut off the root end when you cut an onion. So I'm just going to peel the uh, papery skin off here. And I'm going to show you a trick. It's a little bit trickier now that I've cut this into quarters, but this is the onion cutting trick. So you put it on the widest, flattest spot with the root over here. The root end is over here. I'm not going to cut through that root until the very, very end. So I'm going to take my knife and make some cuts that are parallel with the cutting board. I'm not going to go all the way through to the root, like I said. Okay. And then I'm going to cut some perpendicular to the cutting board. Again, not going all the way up to the top of the root. And then I just chop right through it and I end up with a perfectly diced onion. You can use those layers of the onion to your advantage to reduce your workload. And now we're left with this tiny root that we don't need. So any other bigger pieces you have, you can just run your knife right through because we're gonna be mincing this anyway. Again, all the ingredients going into the tabbouleh are being minced. You could also have done this with um, red onion if you like, if you prefer. I know some people are not a big fan of raw white onion. They prefer raw red onion. That would be totally fine. Um, it would be a slightly different flavor, just as the onions are different flavors, but it would still be super good. So when you mince something, the, the best way to do it is, like I said, put the tip of the knife down, use your other fingers to anchor that tip down so it doesn't leave the cutting board and just pivot back and forth. That's all it takes. All right, so this onion is nice and small, little small pieces. So this is going straight into the bowl with the tomato, parsley, and mint. Right. 
Now we're moving on to the garlic. So I have the garlic calibrated in these recipes for garlic lovers. If you're not a garlic lover, you can reduce the amount of garlic here. But I'm cutting off the root end of the garlic. I have four cloves here. We're gonna be using two cloves for the tubuli and two cloves for the hummus. So now that I've cut the ends off, I'm just gonna slice these roughly. And again, we're gonna be mincing this and doing a fun food science trick that some of you have seen before in the past class or two. We're gonna be making this garlic into a paste. So I'm just slicing all the cloves right now. All right, now that I've got them sliced, I'm just gonna roughly chop them. I'm gonna try and cut them into like pretty small pieces. I'm gonna mince them here. Gotta do it without the garlic flying all over your cutting board, that's the trick. Eliza, are you doing just two right now or all four? I missed I'm, it. I'm doing all four of them because we're making okay. it all into a paste. Yeah. Okay. And then that paste, we're going to end up splitting it in half, but we might as well do it all together at the same time to save ourselves the, the time and effort. That's also a really good um, like food prep trick. If any of you ever, I mean, you know, we all want uh, weeknight dinners to be as easy as possible. So if you are, you know, making something that you know you'll use, like chopping garlic or chopping onion, something that you know you'll use in other dishes, you might as well chop a bunch of it and save yourself the effort later on. All right, so this is basically minced at this point. So this food science trick we're doing is we're making the garlic into a paste, which means we're adding salt and some of, and the salt that we're adding should be considered, you know, when you're adding salt to your dish. So we're not uh, gonna add any salt to the tabbouleh and hummus right off the bat because we're adding salt to the garlic. But of course, if you taste it and you feel like it needs more salt, then go for it. But all right, so we've got our minced garlic here. I'm gonna grab my salt. So this is gonna be, uh, we're doing like about, what did I write down? Like a half a teaspoon of salt. You can do less if you'd like, but you do need to use a, a decent amount in order to make this into a paste. So I just sprinkled it on. Let me move it into the center of the camera. I just sprinkled it over the garlic, that's it. And I'm just gonna go back through, kind of spread the salt around. And adding that salt, salt brings liquid out. That's the, the garlic or whatever it is that you've added salt to. It's trying to um, balance the amount of sodium on the inside and on the outside of that food. And by doing that, it expels liquid to draw in the sodium. So what we're doing here, we have our garlic and our salt in a little pile. We are gonna put your blade down like sideways and I'm gonna use my fingers here and add a decent amount of pressure and you're just gonna start like scraping it. You're squishing that against your cutting board and you should hear that scraping sound. So we're, we're encouraging the garlic to push out some water because that's what's gonna make it into a paste. If you, you know, you've definitely seen this osmosis thing several times. I know my, uh, you know, if we're talking about like a dessert example, I know that my grandma, when she makes cheesecake, she always puts sugar on some cut up strawberries and you just let them sit for a little while and then they get all juicy and liquidy and it becomes like a strawberry syrup. So the same thing works with sugar, same thing as the salt in this case. All right, so I'm just going back and forth over and over. 
scraping it back into a pile, scraping it against the cutting board. And it's definitely getting juicier. I can see the liquid coming out here. Uh, since we're talking about, we were talking about sharp knife blades, a trick that I heard that I keep, I'm not doing it right now. I keep, uh, it's one of those things where you have to like consciously make yourself do this. If you scrape things on your cutting board with the blade side, you're dulling your blade. If you scrape things up with the opposite side, you're saving your blade. So I, I try to do that whenever I can, but it's like a, my instinct is to scrape with the sharp side. So this is really looking good over here. Hopefully yours at home are looking good as well. I'm gonna scrape this into a pile and show you how it looks. So up close, you can see it's definitely like kind of squishier, more homogenized. You can still see some pieces of garlic in there, but the reason we're doing this is because it helps the garlic uh, sort of be incorporated into the dish without overpowering it with big chunks of raw garlic. So I'm gonna scoop this off to the side. I'm gonna put half of this into the tabbouleh bowl right now, and the other half, I'm saving for the hummus. So half of it goes into the tabbouleh bowl right now. All right, got garlic hands now. Okay, so we only have a couple more things to cut. We're almost there at the cutting. And the other ones are very easy. So we've got cucumber. All we have to do is cut the ends off the cucumber and cut it into uh, spears is how I'm doing it. You can also cut it into like uh, chips if you want, but we're gonna be using this just for dipping into the hummus at the end. So this doesn't need to be cut small to go into any, um, to be mixed into any dishes. So these segments are probably about like four inches long. So I'm holding it steady, cutting it in half lengthwise, putting it down on the wide flat side. And then I'll cut each of these halves into maybe like four or five slices here. And then I'm just gonna set the cucumber sticks off to the side. Because like I said, we're just gonna save that for the end for the assembling the platter. So this cucumber just reminded me, uh, I you know was reading up on different um, types of Middle Eastern cuisine. And it's really cool because the countries of the Middle East have a lot of similar ingredients and similar uh, food prep styles to Greece and also Northern Africa, like Morocco and Egypt. Um, so now I've got some lemons. I'm just rolling, putting a little pressure, rolling it so it'll be easy to juice and cutting it in half. There's the two ends, I'm cutting it this way so we can juice it. Set those off to the side. But cucumber is something that you really see often in, um, you know, like tzatziki. That's a classic yogurt and cucumber dish. And yogurt is another thing that you see very often, like yogurt sauces and hummus are two of the most common like condiments in this area of the world. All right, so we've got a bunch of lemons cut in half because you never know how many you'll need. I'm gonna estimate at least two lemons if you're making the amount that is in the recipe that I sent out to you all. Um, but okay, I'm gonna check on the bulgur right now. It's probably pretty good. Yeah, wow, all of the water is gone. That was a perfect amount of time. There's not a little bit of water left and it's also not stuck to the bottom. So this is perfect timing. So I'm mixing it all up. Of course, I have to try some to make sure it's the right texture. So I'm just gonna try a little bit. Yeah, perfect. 
Yeah. All right. So I can turn off my burner now. And in a perfect world, in a longer than one hour class, the vulgar wheat would cool. But for the sake of time, I'm just going to add it right into the tabouli. And I'll tell you that this recipe for the tabouli, the leftovers are even better than when you make it fresh. All right, so in this bowl, we have parsley, mint, tomato, bulgur wheat, garlic paste, and onion. I don't think I missed anything. And we're also gonna be adding some black pepper, some lemon juice, and olive oil. And I think those are all the ingredients in that. Yeah. So the black pepper, I'm gonna do, it's about a quarter teaspoon in the recipe. I'm just gonna do a pinch. We've also got the lemon. So I have a juicer here, which is very helpful. Whenever you juice something, I know it seems like you should fit the lemon in in the same shape, but no, you have to do it upside down to make the juice come out. So I'm gonna start by doing, the recipe calls for a third of a cup of lemon juice. I'm gonna do one and a half uh, lemons here and we'll see how that goes. My lemons are pretty big and they were pretty like getting a little bit soft. So they were really, really juicy. Um, if your lemons were not, they were a little bit more hard. You may want more than one and a half lemons for this. But lemon is such an important flavor in this because of all the herbs, you already know the flavor is gonna be like nice and bright, but the lemon obviously makes it even brighter. This one didn't squeeze very well, so do it by hand. All right, so we've got that. Like I said, we're not adding any salt right off the bat because we had salt in our garlic paste, so I don't wanna overdo it. Um, we added the pepper and then we're gonna add some olive oil. So the recipe calls for a quarter cup of olive oil. I'm an olive oil lover, and so is this recipe. So don't be shy with the olive oil. You can always add more, can't take away. So you could start low and add a bit more. And I'm just mixing everything together really well. And now that you've got all these flavors in here, you can imagine that after this sits overnight in your fridge, it's gonna taste even better than it does now. But I provided everyone the recipe, but I do intend for that to be more of a guideline. Some people need a bit more assistance uh, when it comes to the amounts of ingredients. So feel free to measure everything if you like, but definitely make this to your taste. Everyone has different taste preferences. Is there a question? Smell. <laughs> oh yeah, the smell. Oh, that smells so good. Love it. All right, that's mixed pretty well. I'm gonna try it. See if I want to add anything else here. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's so good. Awesome. All right. So I think this is done. We're just going to set this aside until we're ready for it at the end. So go ahead and push this out of the way. And let's see off my cutting board a little bit. So the next thing we're going to talk about, oh, it's, it's 15 already, is legumes. So legumes, I'm going to bring another bowl over. Got a big mixing bowl here. We're going to be making some hummus. So I do have uh, three different kinds of legumes here, and I encourage you to maybe try one you haven't tried before. These are cannellini beans, white beans. Of course, we've got chickpeas. These are the classic. And these are red lentils. Believe it or not, they don't look very red, but look at how they used to look when they were raw. The color changes so much. But I wanted to show three different options for making uh, like a legume 
spread of some kind. Uh, hummus is always made with chickpea. Sometimes it might have other things added to it, like red pepper hummus or something like that, but it's always got chickpea. So if you choose to not use chickpea tonight, you can't call it hummus. You gotta call it a legume spread or dip. So I'm gonna start making this. If you have a food processor, go ahead and use that or a blender if you'd like to use that. I'm actually gonna do it by hand because I wanna show another option. And also since we're talking about, we're featuring some traditional recipes today, this is the traditional way. I think I see somebody said chocolate hummus. It's, yeah. If you really love chocolate, it's not for you. If you really love hummus, it is for you. <laughs> so <laughs> beware if you're like looking for a dessert. It's not quite a dessert, it's still hummus. But it is very good, I think it's very good. All right, we've got two cups of chickpea in here. And these were just from the can. You can also cook them from the dried state. But you know that takes soaking overnight. It takes some extra time. So um, if you have the extra time, that's great. But if not, we've got the easy way here. Make sure you rinse your chickpeas really well because that brine in there, it really makes the sodium level very high and it can cause some indigestion as well. So just make sure you, you uh, rinse very well. The other ingredients we're including are a little bit of cayenne pepper. Don't have to go crazy. You don't even have to include this if you don't want to, but it just adds a little bit more flavor. Of course, we're adding lemon. So the recipe for this hummus, it calls for two tablespoons. Um, that That's probably roughly like a half of a good juicy lemon. So again, you can kind of eyeball it. And if you like uh, lemon juice a lot, then you can Add some more later. And also I should mention, if anyone is making this and not using chickpeas, go a little light on the lemon and the olive oil initially because uh, the lentils and the white beans have a really like delicate flavor. They are not as flavorful as chickpeas. So the olive oil and the lemon juice can make you like overdo it easily. So something else that's essential for hummus is tahini. Uh, I didn't include it in the recipe that you all have because you don't need it if you're doing the white beans and the lentils. However, a classic hummus does have tahini. This is sesame paste. So it's just sesame seeds ground up. That's literally all it is. And it's kind of crazy to think those tiny sesame seeds on a burger bun become this, but it's really delicious. So we're adding about a tablespoon, uh, a little more. You can always add more as well. This, uh, I definitely went through a tahini phase at one point where I was drizzling tahini on like all the roasted vegetables I made and it's delicious. So I do highly recommend using tahini just as is if you'd like. So oh, I need our garlic paste as well. Garlic paste, I scooped that off my cutting board. It's not the prettiest, but it tastes great. And I've got a masher here. This is, I should have showed it before I had chickpeas stuck in it, but it's like a zigzaggy pattern. You can use this as like, you know, an avocado masher, potato masher, or a chickpea masher. This is a, like a nice helpful tool to have. If you don't have this and you're making it by hand, you can also use a fork or like even a spoon, like a slotted spoon probably work. So I don't have all the ingredients in here just yet. I'm just trying to mash up these chickpeas a little bit. So what I have in here so far are chickpeas, tahini, cayenne, and, and lemon juice. So I think I'm gonna add my olive oil now. So again, a quarter cup of olive oil. The olive oil really is essential for making this creamy. So don't be shy with that. And the, oh, the garlic paste as well, I forgot to mention, that already has salt in it. So the salt in the garlic paste, the way it helped to bring the moisture out and soften up the garlic, it's doing the same thing for the chickpeas as well. Salt really is like a, a helpful culinary tool. So you can see this is already getting pretty mashed up. Let me just check my list and see if I forgot any other ingredients. But yeah, I think I got everything. 
So once I mash this all up, I'll definitely taste it and see if I want to add any more salt or pepper or anything else. Oh, I didn't add black pepper. I'm going to do that. Eliza, what type of salt do you use? I like to use kosher salt. Okay. Um, like I, I like a nice flaky salt because it adds, like, I'm, you know, as you know from attending these classes, I'm very much about the way your food looks. <laughs> so a nice flaky salt on the at the end, you know, putting that on top of your dish, it really makes it look so beautiful. But uh, as far as like nutrients go, if, you know, some people, you know, might have heard some misinformation that, you know, table salt has more sodium or something like that, but that's not true. Salt is salt. It's all got the same sodium. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's pink Himalayan salt. It doesn't matter if it's a super expensive salt that you bought on vacation or something. It's still the same amount of sodium. <laughs> but yeah, some of the, the flaky ones. There's another brand called Malden, M-A-L-D-O-N. That's the kind of salt that you'll see in like a chef specialty store. When you go to a fancy restaurant, that's the kind of salt that they use at the end. Uh, it's very like delicate flakes. I'm adding a little bit more olive oil because I want this to be nice and creamy. So like I said, if you had a food processor, you could use that. You would be done by now. <laughs> it's really, really easy. Um, hummus is something that so many people buy, but this is incredibly easy. You know, in a food processor, it's even easier. And you can add things like roasted pepper or, you know, um, I've seen like sitar or pine nut um, hummus, like all kinds of stuff. You can add whatever flavors you like. Um, I've also seen, we've made here in our cafes, we've made like edamame hummus, uh, where we do have chickpeas, but also edamame. Um, and uh, what else have we done? We did do the chocolate hummus one time and it was really funny to see the like reactions. <laughs> you really got a feel for like, if someone liked healthy food or not when they try a chocolate hummus. Um, okay, so I'm gonna give this a try. So I'll show you up close. If you spread it, it does get like nice and smooth. You do have some good texture in there, just makes it more fun. If you did this in your food processor, it would be completely smooth. All right, so I'm trying a bite of this. Mmm, that's good. I think I might add a little more lemon. I love lemon. And I want to be careful because at this point, at this stage in the hummus game, adding too much lemon will make it too, like, liquidy. So I don't want to do that. I just wanted more flavor. So hummus, you know, it's seen as a condiment or like a dip or something like that. But legumes are really an uh, important part of a Middle Eastern diet and a, an essential part of a vegetarian or vegan diet. Um, so when I say legumes, I mean any kind of bean and any kind of lentil. And believe it or not, peanuts are actually also classified as a legume, the way they grow on the plant. Uh, lentils have, uh, let's see, gram for gram, they are the protein source that has the smallest carbon footprint with uh, the highest carbon footprint for protein sources on the other end is lamb, which is also a very popular uh, protein in Middle Eastern cuisine. But maybe by incorporating lentils and beans, they kind of help to balance it out. <laughs> All right, so this hummus is good to go. So, all right, we're looking at 622 right now. So good timing. Right now I have some pita bread. I've got a few different, uh, three pita breads here. You can get wheat or white, whatever you prefer. I'm just gonna lay these flat and cut them. I'm gonna cut them, I might do them into eights. So I'm just cutting them across, turning. Cutting them again. And the pita bread is going to be used for dipping in the hummus. And I'll cut again. 
So some people would say, and they'd probably be right, that by calling it pita bread is uh, redundant. Pita is the bread. <laughs> so no need to call it pita bread. It's just pita. I feel like so often you hear it called pita bread, so that's just what we all call it. But all right, I'm putting this pita to the side, and I'm going to grab our platter, and we're going to start plating it up. So we've got all of our ingredients. I'm gonna start with spreading the hummus on the bottom. I'm gonna take a nice big spoon, scoop out a good amount of hummus here. So like I said at the beginning, if you have a nice big platter at home or a big plate, I recommend you making like a really beautiful display. Um, Middle Eastern, um, you know, meals are typically, well, with dinner specifically, meze platters are very often eaten as a dinner meal because lunch tends to be the biggest meal of the day. So a meze platter just like this is meant to be eaten as like a light dinner option. and pita is the utensil. So I've got my cucumbers, my cherry tomatoes. I'm gonna to throw some tabbouleh on here before it gets too full. So we've got our beautiful tabbouleh here. Let's see, I'll put some in the corners here. Uh, while I was doing my research, I came across some information, I was thinking about hummus, um, some information that said the oldest known hummus recipe was from uh, Egypt, so Northern Africa, and was from the 1200s, the oldest recorded hummus recipe. So that's pretty old. <laughs> Uh, what do I want to do next? I think I'm going to do, I'll do some olives. I have some mixed olives here. These are like um, palmatas. We've got some castel vetranos. So I'm just going to throw these on here kind of haphazardly. This is the fun part. You get to just make it look however you feel like it should look. So also, if any of you have heard about, there's a trend going around on social media uh, about what they're calling girl dinner. Uh, if anyone has heard about it, uh, I think New York Times also wrote something about it. Girl dinner is kind of the a thing where like, if you're home alone, your partner is not there and you're eating whatever you feel like for dinner, you tend to eat lots of fun snacky things. That's kind of like what girl dinner is. And I would say that this is a great example of girl dinner. <laughs> um, and as someone who eats girl dinner without knowing that it was a trend, I feel like I'm throwing some dried fruit on here now, apricots, dates, lots of fun stuff here, some figs. Um, but I feel like the good thing about something like girl dinner where you eat uh, you know, just a bunch of snacky stuff, it's fun and it can be more like almost almost more satisfying um, mentally and physically. Because if you eat like a snacky dinner like this, or if you have an appetizer dinner or a meze platter for dinner, you are um, taking your time eating. It takes a bit longer. So you're realizing that you're satisfied maybe more quickly than you would have if you were eating something that's just like, you know, easy to scoop with a spoon into your mouth. We've got some mixed nuts here cashews, walnuts, and pistachios that I'm going to throw on here as well. Um, so it takes you a bit longer to eat, and uh, it just makes it more fun. It makes you kind of like more mentally satisfied with what you're eating by, you know, choosing all your favorite things and putting them in one place. 
So these nuts and the dried fruit that we used, these are all uh, options that are commonly seen in um, Middle Eastern cuisine. Pistachios especially are used you know, all over the Middle East and uh, dates and figs are also incredibly popular in that cuisine. And dates and figs and other dried fruits and even fresh fruits are often used in savory dishes in Middle Eastern cuisine as well, not just as sweet options. So adding it to this dish kind of just makes sense. Uh, I want to check my list and make sure I didn't miss anything, but I think I got all the components here. I think we got it all. So of course, you have to drizzle with some olive oil at the end. You can't have a meze without additional olive oil. And maybe I'll even use some little flaky salt since we talked about it. Some nice flaky salt at the end on top. And here we are. This is a really packed plate with lots of super, super good flavors, all different textures, different flavors, different aromas, uh, different colors. I always talk about this in all these classes that we want variety. Variety makes you interested and makes you feel satisfied. Variety in texture, color, flavor, everything. So this is an excellent example. You can see for scale, this is how what size this is compared to my head. This is a nice big platter. Kathleen and I will be splitting this for dinner tonight. Um, but yeah, I would love to, I'm going to do a uh, gallery view here and see those of you cooking at home, Bev and Cynthia. How's it going? And anybody has any heavy questions in the meantime? Um, I, um, when I shopped, I was kind of in a hurry and they didn't have the crumbled feta. So I got the um, brick. Do you have um, a suggestion about how to- Crumble it? Or, yeah. The I best present. way to do it, honestly, is just your fingers. Your fingers are gonna get really greasy, but the best way to do it is just to go like this. Just crumble it, okay. And just okay. crumble it. Well, here's- I don't know. chop it. You Can want. you see? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, I like that platter. That's perfect. So that's like, I don't know, maybe a third of the hummus um, yeah. and a third of the tabbouleh because it's just two of us. So yeah. And now you get to see what the leftover tabbouleh tastes like. It's going to be right. <laughs> How about you, Sin? I, I have not assembled the platter yet, um, but I am so looking forward to the tabbouleh today and tomorrow. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I can imagine it absorbs the flavors. Oh yeah, definitely. It's so good. It's so good. You can also eat the tabbouleh like inside a pita pocket. You can spread some hummus and tabbouleh inside the pita instead of dipping the uh -huh. pita in that. So that's a different vehicle for the pita. But um, yeah, all of these leftovers are, they're, they're great as leftovers. So yeah. Uh, any questions from anybody? That was great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, this is awesome. This is a great class. I feel like we we ended like right at the right time, which is great. And a lot of stuff happened, so I was a little bit nervous, but we did it. <laughs> um, so please, uh, Cynthia, I would love to see a picture when your platter is done. I'd love to email <laughs> me one. I would love to see. Um, if any of you end up cooking along, please send me a photo. I would love to see it. Um, like I said in the beginning, you all will receive the uh, link to the recording. So you can watch along if you'd like to cook this later. And uh, again, I'll send out the recipe too if you need that again. But um, yeah, I feel like this is a great option for a girl dinner or for like, uh, you know, a fun dinner party or something like that. So I hope you all get to try it. And I hope you all have an awesome night. Thank you. Thank you so, Thank much. You. so much. Thank you very much. Bye. Have a good one. Thanks. Thank you.